going to go briefly over some basic necropsy procedures um, from Chapter 17. Just the things I want you to know right now. I want to talk basically about some necropsy preparation, specimen handling. Um, at some point um, in uh, early, pretty early in our course and our program, we're going to be doing a necropsy together um, and talk through the process a little bit more. So what is a necropsy? It's examination of an animal after death to determine abnormal or disease-related changes that occurred in life. The term traditionally applies to animals, whereas we use autopsy, uh, which is synonymous and usually applied to humans. Some necropsy-related terms I need you to know. Pathology is the science and study of disease of abnormal conditions. Gross pathology is um, where you have pathologic changes in tissue that are visible with the unaided eye, so something you can see. Histopathology are pathologic changes in tissue that are microscopic. Histopathology gives us the architecture of the tissue. Les lesions are what we call alterations or abnormalities abnormalities in tissue, any pathologic changes. Pathogenesis is a sequence of events that lead to or underlie a disease. So the beginning of pathogenesis, beginning of pathology, pathogenesis. Purposes of necropsy is to determine processes that led to the animal's death or establish a cause of death. It could be to verify a pre-mortem diagnosis. So if the doctor or the, cl um, the client want to know that you know, what we diagnosed was in, in, in fact um, occurring with a pet. To establish the positive or negative effects of treatment before the animal's de demise. So if we uh, were uh, trying to see if our treatment was working or not. Um, determine whether other animals may be at risk for infection or injury or environmental hazard. So if you have an animal die, there are other animals in the environment, um, we might want to do um, a necropsy to make sure that they're going to remain safe. So before we begin, we want to make sure that you have the client's consent in writing. Uh, you might be able to do this over the phone, not in writing, if you have a number of people um, that witness uh, the client consenting to it. You want to verify the patient identification. So, for instance, if they have a microchip, you want to verify that they are that um, patient. Obtain the client's preference for body disposal. You need to know what you'll need to do with the body um, when you're finished before you start. You want to do the ne necropsy as soon as you possibly can. Uh, if you cannot, you can refrigerate it with ID tags so you can identify it later. later. You do not want to freeze the body as that will change the tissue. You want to include full identifying information regarding the client on the report form. Uh, the report form is very long and detailed, and we want to make sure that we have all of the information on this animal as, as much as possible. You want to review complete history of events leading to the necropsy, including ca cause and time of death. When we're doing a necropsy report, we want to do it as the necropsy is being performed. We want to describe and record all abnormalities. And you want to be very specific in your descriptions. Now, when I am doing a necropsy, I'm not going to be able to um, hold a pen and write down what I, I, I perform. So when I do it, I'm going to be having you all record the abnormalities as I call them out. So you, you may have to tell me to slow down or ask questions, but that's really important that you do so um, as we go through the necropsy. After the necropsy is completed, you want to report in writing in the medical record all the findings of the necropsy. You can make some tentative conclusions at the end of the report, um, and then just when we're describing any lesions that we find, we're going to give the location where we find it, number of lesions, their color, their size, shape, distribution, consistency, and odor, anything that will help us to identify those lesions later on. Often we're going to send away what we call fixed tissues, tissues that we have um, put in formalin um, so that they can be looked on, um, at under a microscope for histopathology. When we're using fixed tissues, we want to note the type of fixative because different fixatives will cause different changes um, or um, preserve the tissue differently. Uh, so any other identifying information on the specimen container as well. Um, the different types of fixatives that we might use. Type, uh, type 1, 10% buffered formalin. This is 9 parts water and 1 part formaldehyde. It is the most widely used fixative, the kind that you'll find in the little jars. Um, 
and the kind that typically is used to fix uh, dissection uh, animals. Um, we need to fix these, uh, these tissues in large volumes. It's a 10 to 1 formalin to tissue ratio. So it's a 10% uh, buffered formalin, and when we put large tissues in it, we need to use a lot of formalin. Um, very often what we'll do is we'll put this large tissue in this very tiny mug and so but not really enough so what we'll lab and they'll say they need additional time to fix it and they'll, they'll put it in a much bigger container of formalin in order to fix it properly 50 percent and formaldehyde, it's best for larger tissues or those that are thicker, so whole brain, intact spinal cord, and bones. The Bouin fixative is rarely used, but particularly good for preserving cell details and has less tissue shrinkage. So we're going to use the Bouin fixative for fetal tissues, intestinal epithelium, eyes, testes, and endocrine glands. And these are this Bouin fixative can be purchased from outside sources. So those are the three different types of fixatives that you will need to remember. So buffered formalin, 10% buffered formalin, normal stuff. 50% formalin, thicker stuff. Bouin fixative, fine things. So eyes, fetal tissues, that kind of thing. So fresh tissues. Sometimes we need to collect tissues without adding preservatives. Um, we might put it in freezer packs or refrigerate it, get it shipped as quickly as possible, or even take it to the lab yourself. Um, we might do this for toxicology. Um, so we, if we fix it, we won't be able to find um, toxins. Uh, we might um, uh, put through blood, liver, stomach contents, kidney, fat, brain, and urine. Um, if we have rabies, we're going to send the animal's head um, the entire head is going to be sent in, not fixed. If we have intestine submitted, we want 10, at least 10 centimeters and we want it tied off because we can't have it leaking everywhere. Uh, and then if we were going to do some cytologic examination, uh, we can make some smears on slides, uh, we've, which we've talked about, um, and we're going to send those away as fresh tissues. And uh, Obviously, we want to send it unstained. Um, we can stain it ourselves if we want to look at it, but we want to send it unstained and away from the formalin, uh, the fixed tissues, because that will cause problems with the stains or with the um, slides. If we're going to send in swabs, so if we need to culture something or send in whole blood or serum or fluid or feces, we should check with the lab to see what kind, how we want, they want us to send it in. But we can take a swab of any infected area for a bacterial culture, viral growth, molecular testing. We want to ship swabs to the laboratory in the same way that we do ship um, fresh tissues. Um, blood samples can be taken before death if we can. We can also take blood samples uh, directly after death or even collect blood clot. We just have to realize that the chemical chemistry will be off. Um, we can also collect feces for laboratory tests. Anything that we collect, we want to put in a rigid leak-proof container. I can show you examples of those um, with an outer leak-proof container as well. So to at least two containers. And typically, we're going to put um, something um, absorbent around it, so paper towels or some sort of absorbent substance around the, the leak-proof container. Uh, we want to label both the primary and secondary containers. Um, there's a special packaging symbol that we have to put with it. It's called UN3373. Put it in a rigid shipping box. Cushion those contents. We may have to use freezer packs, never ice, because ice will melt and uh, melt uh, when it melts, it will leak, and like I said, um, the, uh, people who deliver packages do not like leaking packages. You do not want to put um, submission forms next to primary containers because that could damage the forms. We want to enclose them in a, um, in a plastic bag so they, when they get to the laboratory, they can read the forms. Our necropsy area should be well lit, very easy to disinfect, have adequate drainage for fluids and water be large enough to be well ventilated and apart from surgical inpatient areas. Uh, when I was at uh, OSU, it was a whole different, whole separate building, lots of drains in the floor. Um, we were all responsible for cleaning up afterwards. It was a lot of hosing down, rubber boots, um, pretty messy stuff. Um, protective clothing, you should have protective clothing. You never know what the animal is um, 
carrying, so gloves, uh, waterproof uh, scrubs or aprons, rubber boots, um, goggles, surgical masks, etc. We might use a mesh glove um, if we're because we're using large blades. Um, so on a non-dominant hand, you also see um, a scrub brush and a bucket here for scrubbing down your boots when you're finished. Some instruments that you might see in a necropsy. Uh, necropsy knives are kept very sharp. Uh, you might have serrated utility scissors, pruning shears, forceps, um, uh, thumb forceps, saws, string or hemostats, labeled plastic buckets, bags, vials, bottles, and culturettes. So lots of things available uh, in order to do our job. Anytime we collect tissues, we need to think, are we looking for bacteria, viral infection, mycotic infection, mycoplasma infection, because those are going to be stored slightly differently and cultured slightly differently. What kind of culturettes are we going to need? Are we going to need sterile tubes? Are we going to need sterile instruments uh, in order to get into a space that we don't want to contaminate before we get a culture? So these are things that we need to think about and label ahead of time. So um, things to measure, uh, things to tie off, um, things to cut. Um, a lot of thought goes into this. When we're collecting tissues, we want to handle tissues gently. Remember that people are going to be looking at these tissues under a microscope and they can see when you crush it with a thumb forcep. So it doesn't really matter how careful you are, they're going to see um, and they're not going to know what caused this kind of damage if it happened before or after death. So you want to be very careful not to squeeze, stretch, or rinse tissues. Um, samples can be placed in a jar with fixative. Small bits of tissue can be put into a tissue cassette. If we have paired organs, often um, we'll trim them slightly differently so we can always distinguish them from each other. So if we have, for instance, a left kidney and a right kidney, we might cut them slightly differently. We want to mark on a specimen which container um, contains what. So there's no question about what, what piece belongs to where. So some um, things that are really critical to when we're sending in um, tissue, the lung and myocardium, so lung and heart, liver, spleen, and pancreas, stomach, small intestines, colon, lymph nodes, kidney, urinary bladder, endocrine muscle, organ, skeletal muscle, and a whole brain. So typically what I say is the, the basic ones you want to send in would be lung, heart, liver, uh, kidney, and uh, potentially the spleen. But it really depends on what you're looking for uh, and what you see during your necropsy. Um, last part of this lecture is going to be covered during an in-class necropsy, um, but I would take, recommend that you take a look at it at some point um, before we do the necropsy uh, and save this for later because this is information that you're going to need to know uh, for later. So when you are looking through the, the lecture without my recording, please take a minute and go through those slides and stop and read, ask questions about any parts of those slides that you have questions about.